Welcome to Geeks of the North, a hobby and gaming podcast about Belle Provence. This week, Antoine Yeom and I are talking about growing as a painter and what you can do to improve your skill set. So why don't you sit back, relax, grab a paintbrush, and enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Geeks of the North. As always, I'm your host, Paul Filio, here with my co-host, Antoine Bergeron. Hello! And Yom La Machine. Hi! Hi again. Two in a row, Yom. Yeah, it's crazy! Can't believe it. Pretty soon you're going to have a chair with your name on it and everything. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> my private uh, parking space and everything. That's right, that's right. <laughs> you can park your ass there anytime. Uh, so, uh, this should be a, well, the first section is going to be a bit shorter than usual, I think. And main topic, I think we'll probably be able to drag on for a bit because it's going to be a lot of talking and we all love to talk. Um, well, except for Antoine, but Yom loves to hear his own voice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, how to grow as a painter, you know, how to, what resources there are to help develop your, your ability. So, uh, I think it's going to be a pretty cool hobby related topic. We haven't had one for a bit. Uh, but before we get there, we have to do the hobby time. So let's jump on in. Um, and as always, I'll go first, because I'm me. So, hobby. Uh, I've had a, a fairly productive week. It's only been a week since the last recording, so this, this section's going to be fairly short for everyone else. But I kind of pack things in. Um, I've been working on my commission, the Blight Wasps. And uh, I have to say, those models are not growing on me at all. <laughs> well... The uh, the client based the models like he he glued them to their stands already, and they're transparent to acrylic, right? Mm -hmm. So, and he wants to keep them like that. So trying to paint these little miniatures that are really kind of stuck to the base, without getting paint all over the acrylic stands, it, it's really kind of kind of annoying. Um, and so like the. The wasps, the legs are so close to the stands, I can't even get tape up in between to, to properly Damn. mask. Okay. And even if I could, I still I wouldn't be able to paint the inside of the leg. Um, so it's just really annoying. And I asked about maybe trying to break them off the stands, and he just pinned them with like crazy long pins. I guess there's a pin that goes up through the body of the thing, and there's enough crazy glue to kill, you know, the small horse. So I don't think there's any way I could, you know, debase them without breaking those acrylic stands. So I'm just fighting with them. Uh, that's not nice. How many do you have to do? Twelve. Oh, okay. Three units, yeah. So I'm trying to trying to work my way through those. Uh, they're due for next weekend. And I have to paint a, an e Epsilonia for him, but that should go easier. So I'll start her hopefully by Wednesday and get her done for Saturday, Sunday. Um, uh, aside from that, I've been reading. Uh, I've been reading some of the new releases from Games Workshop for Age of Sigmar. Uh, they released a, a Grand Alliance Chaos book, which I picked up just because it was such a super deal. It's a 300-page soft cover for 40 bucks Canadian. Okay. That's, uh, yeah, that's that's really mm. cheap for. <laughs> GW. Yeah, exactly. For it, it's soft cover, but it's high quality paper. It's like satin finish, uh, and it is 300 pages full color. So at 40 dollars Canadian, that's a it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, for um, Game Workshop, yes. <laughs> Yes. Well, I think I think for anyone, really. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yes. <laughs> but especially for them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but to counterbalance that, they also released a hardcover um, Age of Sigmar book called Balance of Power. It's the second book in the uh, Realmgate Wars campaign setting, or campaign series. And that book was $90 Canadian. <laughs> so for they sure. balance out, you know. So, more so more in tune, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what do you find in the Grand Alliance Chaos book? Like is it there's their rules for it's uh it's new wars well it's war scrolls for everything okay and it's uh and for anything anything it's chaos right so the Archeon book or the ever chosen book whatever it's called uh, warriors demons um you know all the goodies all the baddies all, you mean all the, yeah yeah exactly all the bad but good yeah uh, all in one place with some fluff and you know just painting guide and tutorials and it makes me think of almost 
like a, a second edition 40k codex. You know, where you had like the painting guide in it and the fluff and then all the unit choices and stuff. So it's kind of formatted like that. Um, and balance of power, I just kind of flip through. It's it's a lot of fluff. It's got some some formation type things, and it's got scenarios. I haven't looked at the scenarios yet. Uh, I I, <laughs> and I actually posted a tweet because I was so kind of annoyed with Games Workshop, um, just because the the book quality is so good, but the game is still Age of Sigmar, right? So I'm like, what? Why do you spend so much developing all this cool stuff? for a game that you basically just threw out there, you know, like that. Untested, unfinished, on whatever, you know. It, I find it uh, strange. Do we... Is it too early to have numbers for... Yeah, it's too early, right? To have numbers for Age of Sigmar release? We won't have numbers. They, they don't share it by game. Okay. I mean, uh, they did their last their last quarterly report... And it showed that miniature sales were down 15%. Mm -hmm. But IP sales are up, so they've got a lot more licensees for video games and stuff. So, um, I mean, and from when I talk to uh, my Games Workshop rep, the kind of information I get from her is it, it's, Age of Sigmar is doing okay in some places, not doing very well in others. And it, it depends a lot on the age group of the people that the, the store draws. Okay. So if it's a lot of older gamers, Age of Sigmar is not doing well with like our generation of gamers. Not to say there's no one our age who plays it and likes it. And if you do play it and like it, that's that's great. Good for you. Um, yeah. We accept everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's there's nothing wrong with liking the game. No, no. It's just it's just not for me. And I, you know, I I still, I still feel a bit butt hurt over uh, fantasy getting killed like that. And you know, I'm me having three or four hundred min miniatures I'll never use for anything ever again. So, um, unless I start playing Kings of War or whatever. Uh, but uh, if they have a, if the stores draw a young crowd, Age of Sigmar is really kind of drawing in those people. And we were talking last show about uh, Relic Blade and kids, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I finally, I, I started thinking that maybe Age of Sigmar, you know, if you want your kids to get into miniature war gaming, teach them Age of Sigmar, because there's the you can't get much more basic than that. Um, I'm not you know, sure the, I agree. Just but, the cost of the miniatures, the game needing, uh, the like the miniatures assembly being a pain. It's, there are still Game Workshop models, uh, a, a games a simple game like Relic Blade. You're gonna use bones or one piece uh, pewter model, not. 25 piece yeah. dwarves and that you need not just five you need a lot more than that well there's there's no technically there's no size requirement for age of sigmar uh, i i do agree the models are, are super complex i just assume people would have models they would use or you know there's no reason you couldn't proxy stuff right yeah, but yeah. i i don't I'm, see it as an intro game for somebody who have never played anything for for a child maybe a teen maybe but for people like yeah. us who want to make the kids try a game, that's too much stuff. That's yeah. yeah. Uh, well, between a lot young meaning. kids and uh, young teens, young teens would be fine with the Age of Sigmar. That's true. Age of Sigmar is a lot of reading. It just the like, you could proxy the models. The models don't really matter to me that much. But the uh, there's a lot of content on each of those war, war scrolls and a lot of mm -hmm. interactions. Yeah, I always tend to forget that. I was just thinking the core rules themselves are are st stupid simple. But then there's everything else from all the different units you pick that changes everything. Yeah. Fair enough. I retract my statement. <laughs> so points for Relic Blade again. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> no, no. And and points for relics too, just because you know we haven't mentioned Tor yet. So. Yep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, if you remove the second part from Relic Blade, well, we're talking about relics now. Yeah, so aside from that, aside from off the age of Sigmar reading I've been doing, um, I've uh, been planning my my army for my annual game of Apocalypse with Yom. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like our, our our birthday tradition for his birthday. Yep. Where I, we play a game of Apocalypse and Yom beats me. It, so it became my annual game of 40k actually. <laughs> yeah. 
So I played Space Marines last two years, and I decided that you know what, it's time for a change. So I'm, I'm trying to decide between two different armies right now. Either uh, Tau or uh, Adeptus Mechanicus. So that's my thing. Yeah. Now Adeptus Mechanicus will probably have allies and so will the Tau for that matter. But uh, I could do a Tau Eldar Xenos army if you don't fight you. That'd be kind of interesting. If you want, if you use the Tau, I have a, a Barracuda I can lend you. Ooh. To get you a, a flyer on the table. Pretty cool, uh, yeah. Uh, scratch build Barracuda, that's true, that's true. Oh, I remember that. You showed me that a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that thing was pretty awesome. Yeah, For so, a piece uh, of foam, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's well-shaped foam, though. Um... Yeah, but so, uh, uh, if you change army, does it mean you have to paint all these? Yeah, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you say so, man. Whatever floats. But yeah, it's so... cool that you take it so seriously. I really appreciate that, Paul. Is oh, that it's... Mick? He already has two knights painted. Two knights, and I, you know, I'm actually... Um... It's going to be Admech with a, a Titan Legion, I think. <laughs> you know, my three Titans, my uh, four Knights. Uh, all kind of thematically joined, I think it'd be cool. You won't have much point left in the way for regular troops, so you don't need to paint that much. Yeah, it's well, true. Well, <laughs> what's, what's a Reaver Titan? 1,200 points or something? And the two Warhounds are 700 or 750 each. And we're playing like 8,000 points, so I'll still have like 4,500 points to paint. Oh, yeah, the two knights also. Oh, yeah, the knights are like three, yeah. So it's four knights. So what is that? Four times four is 1,600 plus 1,400, so it's 3,000, 4,000. Oh, I'll, st- I'll still have like 3,500 points to paint. That's okay. I'll figure it out. Lots of Castellan robots. Uh. <laughs> Painted like Big Hero 6 is for, for jokes. So many titans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to run out of uh, nubs. <laughs> of <a> Parkland nubs. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> Just the Reaver Titan. How many nubs is going to take to take that thing down? Okay. Ah, it's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> the way you play, you'll like shoot at it with a flyer that really shouldn't hurt it, but you'll take down its void shields and you'll one-shot it with your your like eye laser off your gargant. And I'll scream. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, th- the way it usually goes. Oh, sorry, yeah, the um, the other thing is that the Adeptus Mechanicus, I've painted my Imperial Guard uh, to go with them. Thinking that the, the, the guard are stationed uh, on the planet, the PDF, the Planetary Defense Force for the... Uh, for that... Um, Adeptus uh, Mechanicus Monastery. Cool. Yeah, so I kind of got this whole theme thing going. Mm-hmm. You've put, uh, I put some thought, thought into it. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we we always we always play kind of thematic, right? We're not we're not playing to win, and we're not uh, we're not doing anything completely ridiculous. The game size is completely ridiculous, but mm-hmm. you know, we're we're not that uh, power gamery. And it was funny. I don't know if you saw uh, Logan from uh, One Plus Armor po- posted a picture with uh, at a 40k tournament this weekend with a, an Eldar army, and it was just a bunch of jet bikes with scatter lasers and things with D weapons, and he called it like the army of someone who doesn't want friends. <laughs> and I, I think that was his army, and he was playing with uh, with Chris from Canhammer, and I think he also had an Eldar army with even more de-weapons. And they were kind of uh, joking about how, you know, their armies were completely... Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Douche? That would be a good word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that kind of... You know, and, and I get it. It's a competitive environment. But I just commented that this is, you know... This is a perfect example of what's wrong with 40k now. And he replied, Win page, read page four or something like that. 
and I re- just replied, I reiterate, this is the problem with, <laughs> with 40k right now, <laughs> you know? Um, it's, it's, it needs, it's gone very freeform, and the fact that you can just take anything, any way, and build armies any way you like now, um, no, I, I think, agree. I, I, I think it's just kind of ruining the game for most people. Oh yeah, I think it's out of control, and uh, their 40k is miles from the 40k I used to play. It's, it's, yeah, it's like another world. It's it's unrecognizable anymore, right? Yeah. And again, you know, you have fun playing that, no problem. You you want to go to a tournament, and you know that's the thing. If you're going to a tournament, you know you're going to face armies like that. So if you play an army like that, that's cool. And I'm sure in a casual environment, they don't play that type of army. Um. But I think that's the problem with the game. And I'm wondering what's going to happen, because I have a sneaky suspicion 40k is going to get the Age of Sigmar treatment at some point in the future. And I'm wondering what chaos is going to happen then. <laughs> the but anyway. The latest that's... rumor where that they would remove points but use uh, battle groups or something like that. Yeah, formations. Yeah, formations, formations for everything. Which, which doesn't is... change anything. Because no, except people are using the size. only formations now. And yeah, sure. It yeah. just makes it worse without points. Yeah, exactly. It just it just compounds the problem. Well, it will do the same thing as Fantasy did. Uh, Age of Sigmar, people will do pools or points or stuff. Yeah, like there'll that have too. to be comp systems and all yeah. that fun stuff. Yeah, Games Workshop will put it squarely in the hands of the players to fix figure figure out a way to play the game. Um, anyway, that is what it is. And last on my hobby, and uh, moving right out of that, uh, before I get more depressed. Uh, last thing of my hobby, I have been, been planning my Reaver Titan paint job. Um, I think uh, it's going to have to be something cool. I think I'm going to paint, uh, you know, Yom's logo on the side of the Reaver Titan with a big bar through it. You know, it's like <laughs> the anti Yom Titan. <laughs> That's leg- that sounds legit. Yeah, it's it totally <laughs> legit. Squashed orcs <laughs> under its foot. <laughs> oh boy! A fistful of knobs or something on it. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I can see it. I can see. Actually, it I don't. I don't remember what weapons I bought for it. I think it's got. I I know it's got the missile pod on its back, and I think it's got the uh, the triple barreled like. Uh, Oh, what's it called? The laser. The, the turbo lasers? Yeah, the, the the turbo laser. But it's like a... It's a bigger version of the turbo laser. Turbo laser is what's on the Warhound. And I think the other one's the uh, the volcano cannon is on the other arm, I think. Yeah. Those turbo lasers are really scary. Well, I think the, the other weapon is the... Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the 18-inch template. <laughs> so. No... <laughs> yeah, you know, nothing like Melta in an 18-inch template, buddy. That's start weeping now. Anyway, yeah. So, so I've been, I've been the, you know planning the paint job on that because that's going to be a fun model to paint. Uh, not so much fun to assemble because everything, as as all Forge World kits, it's you know here's a bunch of pistons, uh, cut them to length. Uh, depending on how you position the leg, you know you have to cut everything, customize every piece. And I can't decide if I want to paint the inside of it or not, because the whole inside opens up, right? So you have, like, in the back of it, you've got these, um, like, three little alcoves. Uh, two of them have, like, uh, servitor-type things in it, and there's some computer panels, whatever. And there's a mechanicus guy that's kind of walking around in the room, maintaining stuff. And then the cockpit has the has two or three pilot people in it. And I'm debating if I actually want to paint the insides or just forget it and paint the outside. No. Do you ever plan on opening it? No, but it would bother no. me to know that it's not painted inside. No, 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 no. I think it's only a thing for collectors really painting the inside. It's absolutely useless for gamers. I never I painted insides of tanks. Never. It's useless. I, I know, but I still feel bad. Can you build a model without those pieces in? N- no, not really. No. I. They... Um... They're part of the structure. You can you can yeah. I mean, I mean the head. Them. If I make the head detachable, I could paint the head and the pilots afterwards. Mm-hmm. The the back, like the main body, the interior would be tough to do because I think, and I have to double check the schematics, but I think the alcoves 
are mounted to the thing that becomes the side wall of the main body. Yeah, I do do. So, and because they're they're alcoves, there's like an overhang, so I can't, I can't really paint, the under edge. Mind you, that wouldn't really be visible anyway. I'll I'll have to see. I'll have to see what I can do. Because you could yeah. use those bits or, those parts for biomass or something yeah. else. If that's you can that's very build true. it without them, at least to that's have them true. be useful. And maybe use the uh, Mechanicus guy in the back as one of my Adeptus Mechanicus army commanders or something. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. The Magus or whatever he's called. Yeah. So yeah, so that's that's it for my hobby time. Um, games. I would have had some games because uh, I was supposed to play some Guild Ball uh, and Drop Zone Commander with Antoine. But because my baby was being a jerk last week and didn't let me sleep two nights in a row, I had to cancel. So that, <laughs> that's it for me. My baby's a jerk. Antoine, <laughs> what about you? Well, uh, contrary, uh, I have contrary to you, I have no hobby, but I have some games. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been doing overtime <clears throat> most of the week. So when I'm at home with free time, I'm connecting to the web uh, job server and doing some more work so no hobby for me at least i took one night off and went to uh, our local gaming stores gamers world and you uh, were not available but yom uh, raised his hand and came to he came to the store too to play some <laughs> games with me. so Yay. came to your rescue third yeah. wheel yay <laughs> <laughs> you know yom being second after me isn't that bad True, true. <laughs> Depends on the point of view, but yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, I was able to get a game of Drop Zone Commander. There is a, a slow girl league that started uh, that night. So I, I got one game, Tried finally tried the game with my resistance against uh, Chris, who was playing his... Uh, PHR? No, not the PHR. The, uh, the UCM? UCM, the regular humans, yeah. UCM. So, uh, uh, beginner's luck, uh, I barely crushed him. You barely crushed him? No, 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 no not barely, crushed squarely crushed him. Yeah, uh, wrong oh. word. Squarely okay. crushed him. Nice. Uh, both in points and in, uh, in victory points and in control points. So, <laughs> what, what did you think of the mechanics of the game? It's cool. It goes fast. The, there's two things that I found a bit cumbersome. The CQB. You have so many roles to to do, and yeah, when you're shooting at building with people inside, you have to roll like four times to know if you kill some guys. Like um, you shoot to hit the building, you shoot to damage the building. For each damage you roll, you see if you hit a guy, and after yeah, that you roll to damage them, and they might have a save after that. So it, you can go up to five rolls just to see if some guy in a building were hurt. So that was a bit cumbersome. But the the rest of the game goes, it's fun. And I really like the flow. Like everything was moving fast. I dropped my tanks to be able to shoot the turn after and <laughs> they moved three inches. <laughs> so, oh yeah. They they spent a bunch of their time shooting at buildings because they, <laughs> they were not able to get a line of sight on anything. But you know what? Shooting at buildings is surprisingly effective in that game. Yeah. I, uh, I couldn't, so I, I have a big walker that has two giant chain guns and I never take the thing. And then they, they increase the point cost on it. I'm like, no why? one ever, like, why would you do that? And then I realized that the thing has really poopy range against shooting against vehicles and stuff because they act, they have the active countermeasures, but shooting against buildings, I think the thing's range is infinite and it mulches through buildings. <laughs> it's got so many shots. It's basically designed to like tear apart fast moving tanks and and like buildings mm -hmm. and i'm like oh that's why and then i started playing where i was shooting buildings and i realized how good that is like at one point i was playing um i think i was playing dan and i kept making his infantry run he couldn't get the objectives because he was trying to go through buildings with his with his guys and i was destroying every building he was going into oh, yeah. <laughs> well at the size we were playing it was uh 550 points yeah, yeah. which so is you're, about you're not... starter size yeah exactly. uh, it was taking uh, two or three turns to get a building down. <laughs> but uh, what we found out was that uh, the resistance is really good uh, against air. 
because at five five hundred and fifty, I had just a straight bear starter army for resistance, and half of my units had anti air weapons. So all Chris air was down by turn three. Uh, yeah, both of his it. transport, uh, his big transport for his tanks. He had uh, also a, a ship, an attack ship. Everything was killed really quick. However, his uh, unit of uh, heavier tanks on the table, that I'm not equipped to deal with. <laughs> oh, his... Uh, I can't remember what they're called, but yeah. And they were like regular regular tanks, but they, they have heavier armor and the, the resistance doesn't have that much... Well, well, at least the starter doesn't have a lot of uh, attack power versus uh, high armor. Uh, they're really, really good against low armor, but high armor, that's more difficult. So uh, that's something uh, when I build the army to get to higher points, I need to uh, add stuff that can kill uh, armor 9 up. That's about it. It was fun. Uh, I'll try to get another game this week if I can. After nice. that, so after that, Yom uh, arrived at the store and we played uh, a starter game of Guild Ball. For the slow row, it was still the starter versus starter. That went really fast. Really fast. Uh, how long did we play? <coughs> maybe half an hour? Uh, maybe with the the deploying. <laughs> well, yeah, the with table. the deployment. <laughs> no, it it was crazy fast. It felt like a a quarter, like fifteen minutes playing. Mm-hmm. It, it was so fast. Yeah. And, and that was me was... using a new army also. So, oh, you were playing your um union, your union, the yeah. union, yeah, against my brewers. Uh, no, it was not a standard game. It didn't get really the feel of the game. It was nope. <laughs> over in the blink of an eye. It's like, okay, so it's over, it's over, okay. Yeah. And after that, we played a 100 point games of, a game of Relic Blade. So I nice. al- already tried it at half size. So this time we played full size. And I, Yom, Yom was his first time. Uh, we put a lot of terrain on the table. It was fun. Mm-hmm. Going over, uh, one of my pigs tried to jump uh, a gap that was far too big for how the world works. But still, uh, you you can, once a turn, use an, one of your action dice to add a second dice to your roll or add an extra die to your roll. And with that, I was able to make the jump. So the, the pig flew from one tower <laughs> to the other to jump right next to the uh, relic. But I didn't have enough uh, action points to pick up the relic. So next turn, the bear comes in. Transform, do a smaller jump, and bang, mole my guy. <laughs> yeah, I did the same druid, thing. Right? The druid, yeah, yeah morph into a bear and jump a, a, a bridge or two. So, and then just eat the guy. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. Going into the game, I didn't know that the uh, the the pigs could get their could pick up the relic. So, I was like, oh, he's going for the relic. Oh, problem. <laughs> <laughs> Danger. <laughs> yeah. Isn't there really danger zone? Let's go. And uh, heroes, uh, it's really misguiding because heroes, they can fall fast. Everything can fall fast. <laughs> Gee. I mean, you have three heroes. There's like six pigs. You're like, okay, maybe my guys are tougher, but it took down two of my guys like in one shot. Each time. <laughs> one good attack. Path, heroes down. Okay. <laughs> yep. It's goes really fast yeah that's why you have more equipment to maybe buy out potions and stuff like that you have points to for that mm-hmm. <laughs> for the pigs i had eight points of equipment i could take contrary to your like 25 or something like that yeah but uh, all you take a potion when you get uh, take out of the game in one one hit uh, yeah you need a friend to give it to you or <laughs> healing spells or stuff like that but the, the game was fast and and, and uh, it was fun. It's really cinematic, so uh, I really liked it's, it. How, how did you find the rules with the 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 symbol and the cards? And it's pretty easy to, to yeah, learn. Really easy to learn. You get the hang of it really fast. Um, I thought the flow was good. The flow of the action was good. Uh, it was not really bugging that. Uh, like it's alternate activation. When I'm done, you have more models than you obviously to activate but it was not a problem i don't know 
nothing was uh, cumbersome or heavy or out of place. I think that the rules were are simple and and fine as they are. You you said it's a it's a the usual game hundred points. Yeah, that's the full regular size. Okay. That's good. That's cool. Then it, it's yeah, it's fast game, cool game, cute cute system. Yep, nothing bad to report there. Uh, that's that's it for my game. The only other thing I did uh, was not working on my own stuff, but I've uh, volunteered with uh, with uh, Metal King Studio, the guy who's doing Relic Blade, to translate the rules for the French version. So I've been working a lot on that uh, this week in my commute and stuff uh, and other free time at work. Well, during lunch and stuff like that, if my boss is listening, not during my work hours. And good save, <laughs> good save. <laughs> and uh, another uh, French Canadian is uh, working with that uh, uh, on that with me, and it's going pretty well. Uh, we've done at least half of the car, the quick start rules, and all the generic terms. So we're ready to jump into the the core of the translation now. So it's cool. It, it should be done by before the end of the Kickstarter. I hope. Nice. So, you sliding any joie in there? Just to no, really clean, no. really. Uh, uh, we try to make it uh, international. The the worst thing is like I I hope to be able to play it with the my kids maybe, and same thing for him. But in both case, we mostly play our game in English, so we're mostly doing it for other people to use it and not us. <laughs> you, you didn't even slide a ciggy do in there. I mean, no. Nope. <laughs> oh. Really clean. You, oh, you might have it uh, in, in some of the the fluff, maybe, but for the rules, <laughs> no. The uh, the other person that's working on it is is it uh, Papa Gale? No, no, it's. Uh, I'm missing his uh, last name. It's uh, a guy in Yukon. Okay. Yeah, he's another a, a Montrealer who went there to teach French. So he's uh, he's been there for years, uh, seven or eight years, something like that. So. Wow, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Makes it a bit harder for... Uh, we had a new audio meeting last night to finish the, the basic term together, but with a three-hour difference, and both with kids, means that our meeting was 11 last night. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. So. All but right. It, it went well, and that's it for uh, my side of the things. Okay. Yo? Uh... Hobby. Well, it was a week since last time. Uh, basically, I said last time I was starting uh, Bloodbringer. So yeah, I've been painting uh, Bloodbringer. Uh, that the first one, number one, the, the first Bloodbringer because I have two to do. So this one is the red one in the um, Archangel and Zerial paint scheme that I used. So f I'm just like going through the rough part right now. Um, I don't know if if you remember, but um, I went for a specific scheme in the, on the real in the last and uh, the Archangel uh, painting muscle sinews. It was like, how can I say, faufini. <laughs> yeah, okay. F faking like muscle sinews uh, because the Archangel had a nice, uh, yeah, the, the wooden, the model is done. You, you could see like all those cool muscles. So I tried to put an accent on them so now it's the official scheme but the black brain doesn't have that much so it's basically freehanding the whole thing so i'm just plowing through that right now pretty much <laughs> it's gonna look cool i'm sh i'm sure but uh it's a lot of work huh? it's a lot of work uh, i've seen couples of black bringers on the web so far nothing has really like uh tickled my fancy uh i don't think that people are pushing them enough maybe this one i'm pushing it too much but uh i've yet to see like a really impressive blood bringer anyway personal opinion here sorry um otherwise than that yeah well well games <laughs> i had two games <laughs> Tony already talk about them so yeah so officially i guess i'm i'm joining the guild ball the slow grow 
now they have a, a game in. <laughs> Other games will be with a uh, full team, but uh, the, just with the starter, no, not even no mascots on the on the field. So, yeah, that was really like finished fast. Anyway, yeah, if we were able to get more people on a night, we could easily get four games. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Once the pitch are set on the tables, mm -hmm. it's games are so fast you can just jump from one table to the other. Yeah, yeah. And so my my, my starter is uh, well Tapper obviously uh, with Hooper and Friday. So they they fill their usual roles like Tapper took out a guy, took out the captain. Friday scored a goal, and Hooper was useless. Useless, usual thing. <laughs> He's always useless. So, yeah. Then that's it. That's it for me. Does he at least draw fire? He, like, he, <laughs> he gave your, uh, your your captain the extra dice to be able to kill that. Exactly, uh, exactly, that exactly. He doesn't do anything by himself. He's supposed to, like, his job is supposed to go in and finish stuff that Tapper couldn't finish. That's supposed to be the plan with Hooper. Depending with what influence you can put on him. But what you usually do is... is go somewhere and and support someone else who's gonna attack so in our game you thanks to tapper who gave him extra range on his charge he was able to charge the uh, the how do you say his name black black, black beard or, something like black that. beard yeah black beard the opposite captain uh, and knock him down so next turn when i activate tapper uh well black beard is already knocked down thanks to hooper and hooper is supporting my attack so that's how tapper took him out so he's always somewhere doing something that is not supposed to like not is at full efficiency he's supposed to be able to take out people that's how people you successfully play him but i can i can't apparently <laughs> he's always doing one little thing yeah helping people nice that's what drunk people do i guess oh, i love you man i'm gonna help you <laughs> He's one of those types of drunks. I see. I see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So is that it? Does that wrap it up? Yeah, that's it for me. Awesome. Okay. Well, for once, I had the most productive week. I, I feel very good about myself. Yay, Paul. Yay. Yay, yeah, me. <laughs> High five myself. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I, usually we take a break right now. I think we're just going to do the hobby tip of the episode because it's, it's going to be short. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take a break and we'll come back with our main topic. Could that work with you guys? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So this week, uh, the, hobby tip, the hobby tip of the episode comes from me. And it's about airbrushing. So one of the big pain points by airbrushing is cleaning the airbrush. And you go into any store that sells airbrushes and airbrush paints, they will be more than happy to sell you airbrush cleaner for your airbrush. And I have to tell you, that is a crock. Um... I mean, the stuff works, and it works fine, but it's expensive, and there's much cheaper ways to clean your airbrush. Um, I mean, first off, uh, generally speaking, when you're working with it, a good rinse with water should be all you need. Uh, unless you've got paints, you know, stuck in the cup, or you've been working all day with it, and, you, you know, you've got, you've got to really get a deep clean going on, uh, water should be able to do 90% of the work for you. Uh, after that, you know, you'll see stuff. People talk about thinning with Windex and cleaning in Windex and all that. Don't don't put Windex through your airbrush, folks. That's just a bad plan. Uh, anything with ammonia in it is bad because airbrushes are made of brass. Ammonia reacts with brass. If you want to split nozzles and cause all kinds of problems with the airbrush, yeah, ammonia is the way to do it. And it re reacts with your lungs too. Oh well, so well, what I'm about to recommend also reacts with your lungs. So yeah, wear a mask and, and be smart about it. As Let's much? face it. <laughs> Well, let's face it, you're atomizing stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So you should always be wearing a mask. You should always be practicing, you know, basic safety. Because anything atomized that you can inhale is not good for you. Unless it's air. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, what I'm going to recommend is rubbing alcohol. Now, rubbing alcohol, you can get in a big bottle uh, at the dollar store at the pharmacy. You'll spend like $1.50, $2 Canadian for a big bottle of stuff. Uh, don't buy pure like, isopropyl alcohol because you don't really need it for cleaning. Uh, it has its own uses. Some paints you can thin with it, but you just want rubbing alcohol for this 70% stuff. Dirt cheap and a package of Q-tips. 
So you do your clean with water, you dump out the majority of the paint, you rinse with water, get a little squirt bottle of some kind, uh, you know, dollar store, craft stores will have them. Um, you know, squeeze, uh, squirt some water in the paint cup, rinse it out as much as you can, run it through the brush, rinse it out, then fill with some rubbing alcohol, spray that through. And then you can take a Q-tip where you put some rubbing alcohol on and you can actually clean the inside of the cup, then rinse it out, again, spray through, and then spray some water afterwards and just loosen your needle chuck, back your needle out a little bit so that when it dries, it doesn't stick to the front, so it doesn't stick to the nozzle, and then you're good to go. Uh, you don't need to spend a fortune on, on brush cleaners or specialized solutions. Rubbing alcohol works great. I use it all the time. And even caked on stuff, a little bit of rubbing alcohol and you rub it with a Q-tip, even stuff that's been on the airbrush for weeks will come out. So just be smart. Yeah. You know, and that's it. You know, like you, you taught me how to use the airbrush and uh, I, I stuck to that plan. That rubbing alcohol, that's still what I use. It, work, yeah. it works fine. It works great. I've been I've been using that hairbrush for two years, maybe. I'll only yeah. use rubbing alcohol and uh, never use a sonic cleaner or anything, and it works super fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I use the sonic cleaner because I'm bad. I, I'm a, I'm a great teacher and a lousy example. That's that's the problem. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I I I leave. I, mean, I don't leave paint in the bottom of the cup, but I leave paint on the sides of the cup. I don't clean the brushes, so eventually I have to use something to get I mean I could sit there and, and rub it with a q-tip for a while but the sonic cleaner is just easy I drop them in and I turn it on I walk away I come back eight minutes later and then the stuff's all you know half half coming off on its own so makes okay, it well easy. the exterior of the airbrush is maybe not as clean as the interior in my yeah, case yeah exactly <laughs> me, me it's just the exterior um, you know and, cl and cleaning up the needles alcohol does a great job um, on keeping the needles clean because even if you wipe them down, eventually you'll get a little bit of residue where the needles... There's like yes. a, a Teflon guide inside, uh, just behind the trigger and stuff, or just in front of the trigger on most airbrushes. And I find you get like a little ring of paint there. Yes. So a little rubbing alcohol on the needle to, to keep that needle nice and smooth. And you can also lube the needle and stuff as well, but that's... I don't find that all that necessary. But yeah, so that's that's my hobby tip. And I guess with that, we'll take a quick break, and then we'll come back and talk about our main topic. So we'll be right back, geeks. And we're back. All right, folks. It's time for us to talk about our main topic, and that's how to grow as a painter. Now, this is a tough one because everyone everyone reacts differently to different things. Everyone learns differently. Um, certainly, you know, everyone learns at different speed as well. So these are just a bunch of different points, things that we thought might be helpful for people and, uh, and what, what worked for us. You know, and like Antoine and I were talking about before the show, you know, a lot of things on this list, he never he never does, um, but he knows that other people might find them useful, right? And then again, this is not everything. Don't, don't take this as a step-by-step -step guide on how we got to where we are, because uh, it's not what it is. It's just a, a resource like anything else. So uh, first on our list of things is following painters on social media. I mean, there's a bunch of people out there, guys. Um you know, and, and a few years ago, this wasn't an option. We didn't have this. We had to either try to find blogs or websites or or maybe uh, hang out in a forum. Like, I used to hang out in Bolter and Chainsword and follow a couple artists there in their, um, in their works in progress forum. You know, nowadays, though, with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you've got, you know, 24-hour access to all these great painters. Yep. And uh, a lot of them also post whips, so it gives you pointers. Yeah, or small tutorials sometimes. Yeah. Some sometimes like a just a, a series of uh, pictures, but it's it's like a gradation, it's like a you you see the history, you see the whip happening. So 
you can take pointers from that. Oh, uh, this is, should be maybe the first step if I want to do that technique, or you can take pointers like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's a lot of artists out there like um, like Jim Wapple. He'll he'll post not necessarily full tutorials, but you know a few different steps of things he's done, and with some with some notes, right? So he, he's not going to walk you through everything he did on his in his blog post, but at least it gives you an idea of kind of what he did and in the direction he headed. Yep. Um, yes, and- if that can gives you idea, sometimes it's enough. Yeah, and then there's a ton, not just painters, but there's a ton of uh, uh, of painting uh, groups. Now, this is actually, we mentioned this later on in the doc, but I think it's a good time to put it up here now. Um, aside from following individual artists, you can follow uh, painting groups on Facebook. Like there's the uh, War Machine and Hordes painting uh, that posts stuff regularly uh, of all skill levels. Um, I mean, Yom, I know you follow a ton of them. What are, what are some of the ones you find <sighs> like, useful content? Uh, wow. I, I mean, follow I mostly, I follow mostly, um, painters, but painters, they also paint, they also post in those groups. So you are, you, yeah, you have War Machine slash Ords painting group is one. Uh, Miniature Addicted Animus is one. Carry On yep. Painting is one. Uh, Tabletop Skirmishers. Uh, f- what heavy else? Heavy, he- heavy heavier your metal, yep. yeah. Uh, if your metal is pretty good, you see a lot of good painters there. Um, there's now Shibi Gamers directed mostly at Shibis. <laughs> yep. The name says it. Um, That's true. There's, what's the one? Fansite for Games Workshop also. And the name of the group is Fansite for Games Workshop. Um, so most of the big painters, they will post anyway in those groups. So join those groups and at some point you will see those guys posting that uh, you like what they do so you'll start following their page uh, so now it will always appear on your feed and hey also um, just a quick tip if you change your uh, uh, if you put a lot of likes on those pictures on the, um, or pictures appearing in those groups or those artists page it will change your Facebook algorithm so you will see them more and more on your feed so you don't have to look for them all the time. That's true. But mind you, if you're following them, uh, you'll get posts when... Uh, you'll get notifications from Facebook when people post in those forums anyway, won't you? Uh, oh, no, if only if you're friends, following the artist. Yeah. Depending on your notification level and everything. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's true. not always... It, not everyone. It's, just... it's also because I forget that I'm friends with these artists, so it's I'm in the group and I'm friends with them, so it's telling me they posted stuff. Yeah. That's, that's the other difference, yeah. Um, kind of, kind of along the same notes is uh, following um, or subscribing to channels on YouTube for painters. Um, now, there's a lot of people out there that do um, tutorials on YouTube. Oh yeah, there's you, a... you, you can get some great stuff. Uh, I mean, I used to watch, and, and I think everyone who's ever looked up any 40k painting will stumble across this person. Um, I think her name is Mini Painter Girl. Or girl painter, or something, um, and she's kind of funny because she's very obviously uh, transgendered, so she kind of talks like Mrs. Doubtfire, but with a German accent. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I, she, I saw she, a couple and, of her videos. Thought, is that a guy who tries to pass as a girl, or is, is it a transgender? <laughs> yeah, no, she, she's well, she's a she's a woman now, um, but the uh, her her content is good, especially for starting painters, because she approaches a lot of very very simple um, very simple problems people encounter like painting reds and and you know and she approaches it in a very basic easy to follow way so there's a lot of good content there and and she's just an example of, of you know one of the tons of people you'll find on YouTube uh, Les Bursley you know awesome paint job he does some amazing videos on YouTube that I really enjoy watching um I mean, who else is there, Yom? Antoine? I know there's a few different guys. Uh, those are like a lot are painting Buddha. Uh, they they do also like great videos. Like they will do like a, they will start on a model and do a series of videos. Like each video will focus on a different technique used on that model. So uh, even if at the end the model is like a display level, still it gives you lots of ideas. 
uh, Wargamers Consortium also do videos. Uh, there's a friend Mike from Epic Stuck Duck Studios also. Uh, Massive Voodoo has a lot of videos. Yeah, the Massive Voodoo guys are crazy. Yeah. So is, um, I mean, most of the painting Buddha stuff, I think, is Ben Comets, isn't it? They're, well, they're for different painters, but I'm following mostly Ben Comets, yes. Yeah. He, now he's, now he's not, nuts. He's, he's on his own now, he's freelance. Yeah. But uh, still, you can see all these videos from painting Buddha, but they have a good production value, those videos. Absolutely. You, you see, you always see, like, in a vignette, like a, a little window, is his palette, always, all the time. Oh, nice. So you see the uh, model and you see palette, see his mix and everything. Nice. And I know I've watched a lot of the WGC stuff over the years. Uh, Chang Chao's got some very good kind of intro to airbrushing type videos. Uh, Les is part of that group as well. Um, I don't know if anyone else in that group has videos. I guess uh, Ichiban had a bunch of videos. I don't know if he's still part of that community or not. But, uh, there's uh, a lot of resources out there. Yeah, so and it's, it's easy to find on YouTube. I mean, just miniature painting as a search. <laughs> you'll yeah. see a lot of them. You'll find you'll find a ton of stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so the other thing is kind of linked to this, but it's not uh, in YouTube. It's the uh, buying DVDs and tutorial videos from uh, from artists or, or painting companies. So Simon has produced a bunch uh, Secret Weapon has some, Reaper has some, um, you know, then of course you got uh, Jessica Rich and uh, Jessica Rich has her own series of videos. I think the Jen Haley and Marie uh, ones are distributed by Simon. You've got the uh, painting pyramid stuff with Jim Wapple as well. Yeah, yeah, it is, uh, I think it's uh, downloadable, but uh, yeah, either that you buy the real DVDs or that you download the content. Um, it's mostly the same videos when you said uh, Jessica uh, and Marika. Uh, you, you'll find them on Simon and Reaper. On Secret Weapon Miniature, you will find Jessica, but it's new, I think, that that is offering those DVDs, uh, generally through Simon. But that basically, you can find like those big names, established artists, uh, like award winner, blah, blah, blah. Um, they have made sets of DVDs. So our Jim is just producing so much content that you can buy each videos or a set of videos. Yeah. Uh, don't know the ball. So yeah, just look for them, those big names. Uh, yeah. Established yeah, Jim... artists will have DVDs to their time. Yeah, and also there's uh, Brendan Palmer also has a set of videos through Simon as well. Yo. Where he talks about building terrain and stuff. So some cool stuff there. All to tackle um, a whole army in a week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think it's called One Week Army, in the, that video. Yeah. Um, Jim actually is very different to Jim Wapple. He, uh, his videos are all uh, individual topics. I think each video is 100 minutes. And what's cool about him is when you want to make a bundle, uh, he's got 50 different videos, I think. And you can pick and choose. So he'll have a bundle like, uh, and don't quote me for pricing, this is an example, like five videos for $85. So you're getting 500 minutes of tutorial and you pick the five topics you find interesting. So he's got one on his core technique, which he calls shaded base coat. You know, he's got one on glazing. He's got, uh, you know, non-metallic metal gold, non-metallic metal copper, uh, silvers, uh, painting reds, painting greens, painting blues, painting yellow. Multiple uh, hair, basing. Uh, basing, uh, animals, painting different types of horses and stuff. There's there's a lot of content there, so you you can really customize your downloads, um, and and actually I've I own some of those videos. I, I've you know spent the money and I bought some of those videos, and I I find them really really well put together. And I go back and I rewatch them, because um, I'm like oh I, I, that's you know this type of model, or the the way I'm I, the scheme I'm going for Jim's style would really uh, work well for it. I'm gonna go back and I rewatch the video just kind of refresh myself. On some of his techniques, he's got an interesting way of painting. So, um, well, to say, yeah, the, all these tutorial videos are, are excellent. Um, and then we go analog, right? Read a book. <laughs> Read a book. So, Antoine, you you actually were the one that suggested this because I think you said this was one of the ways that really influenced you. Yeah, the Le Grand Livre de la Figurine uh, by 
a, a bunch of French guy uh, or European guys, which would translate to the big book of miniature. Uh, it's uh, mostly explains the that book's is old, like 15 years old, I think 10 to 15. And it explained how the, the Europe way was to paint back then, like all the la multi layering with tiny, tiny coats and doing under layers to do a, a to do a shade that originated mostly there and it explains a bit how you push your paint or you uh, you draw your uh, your pigments and i my biggest advance in painting was by reading that book and trying examples and trying the different technique on my models because i i don't really watch uh, videos or stuff like that I, i barely visit other conventions so my best source was that book and it still is and other com other books were made like that book uh, as a version too now and one of the guy working on it uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Bonamantable did uh, a newer series called Figopedia that's available in French and English so easier for probably the, the main part of your listenership And other, there are other books too, like uh, Yom, you got the Angel Geraldes book, I think? Yeah, the Angel Geraldes Masterclass book, um, which is no, maybe not as advanced as the Grand Livre de la Figurine or Frigopedia, but uh, it gives you like Angel's technique on how he does all the infinity paint jobs. And it's, it's called a Masterclass book. Uh, of course, you can... It brings you from A to Z to the level of angels, but um, I found it kind of easy. Like, don't be intimidated by, by those books. Uh, I find it kind of easy to see w what steps it takes to get to the models. Um, and now if you follow, since again, the uh, social media uh, painting groups, uh, for the, the Infinity group, There's a lot of people now posting minis that they have painted that look a lot like what Angel do, does. So uh, clearly some people took good pointers from that book. Yeah, I took a look through it and I found it pretty interesting. Now, uh, I know other people have looked at it and they were not very happy with that particular book. But I think it's going to depend on the person, you know, yeah, yeah. like I mean, everything. You take right? what you want. You, it's to each his own. I mean, some people will really learn from it. Some people will be think it's a it's a let down. Maybe it's not world changing, but if it can make you paint like Angel, I think it's a win. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? There's no there's no magic formula, right? No. Nope. And, and yeah, you can take dozens of classes. And, and walk out with, you know, as little or as much as you want. You know, really, it's all, it's all about you. Yeah, all of those things we said, even with the book, uh, people will re react differently to it. Like you said, some people will walk away from a class or a tutorial and say, oh, wow, I've learned something. Other people will, will say, well, okay, I, I knew that, or it's not my style, or whatever, or it's not clicking, or... It, Like you said yourself uh, previously, Paul, in another episode, maybe, uh, you said that it's the results that count. Not Absolutely. The, not the process. So. And, uh, even, even, like, people ask me for, to give classes, but if they knew how I paint, uh, it would make no sense to them. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm taking different avenues, different ways, but the, the, the ending is pretty much what you see nowadays on the web, but uh, the way I, I get I used to get there. It's not typical, so it's not orthodox. Yeah, yeah, not what people would expect. And you know what? Like, you know, I took the uh, the Meg Maples class last year, right? And I I did not get two brush blending. I, I can't do it. I I don't know what I'm missing, like what the 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 hang up is, but I, I just can't do it. And that's the cornerstone technique of her class. But I still walked away with with insights into other things. You know, so so even if you don't get what you expected uh, out of a resource, you'll still likely walk away with something. Yeah. Um, you take pointers, but, and maybe it will affect you or not. That's that's for you to decide, uh, or yeah. what you are more um, uh, comfortable with, also. 
And after that, I think it brings us to the next point. It's practice. I mean, you just take pointers from different ways of doing things and then you practice the hell out of it to see what yeah. works for you. Your your first blend is not going to be perfectly smooth, right? Oh, nope. no. For sure. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, Takes you gonna five, on, uh, yeah. You're going to work on that technique for a long, long time. And, you know, I always love uh, these people I see post online where it's like, this is my first miniature. And they come up with this thing that's, you know, perfect non-metallic metal, uh, you know, super smooth blends. And you're like, okay, that's obviously not your first miniature. <laughs> or you're some sort of world-renowned artist that we don't know about in like another field. Like Jim Wapple, where it's like, oh, you know, I, I was a watercolor artist for, you know, 15 or 20 years. And I just decided to take all those techniques and apply them to miniatures. And I was instantly good. You know, okay, well, you know, you, you have a background in, in art and painting. It, it makes sense. It translates, right? Um, but, you know, for 99.9% .9 of the population, you don't get there right away. It's, no. it's all about practice. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, as you practice, techniques get refined. Techniques evolve and change. You know, while I still paint, there's a lot of similarities in how I paint now and how I painted 10 years ago. There's a lot of subtle differences too, and just the uh, just the application level. You know, my paints are smoother, um, my lines are cleaner. And that's that's all from practice. You you can't get that by watching a video or reading a book. It's it's all from applied technique. Exactly. Your technique will get better. You will find shortcuts also. So there's no other way around it. Yeah, and you will also find like what kind of paint paint brands you like, what kind of paint brushes you like. Yeah, because paints all behave differently. Mm. So a, a brush that will work for me won't work for you because we just don't have the same end and the same touch. Yeah, and it's like the, you know the the a brush that works for Jim Wapple won't work for anyone but Jim Wapple. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I I've. You know what? You know what we do at Adepticon. I'm going to sit down with him. I'm going to record him painting something super small with that giant eight number eight round craft brush that he buys in a pack of ten for four bucks. Because you you have to see it to believe it. <laughs> anyway, it's funny that nobody gets Jim. Yeah, even other artists like watch Jessica him. is like, yeah, I don't know what he does. <laughs> how he does it. Yeah, <laughs> Rhonda Bender. I remember uh, Rhonda uh, paints for Reaper and she does some beautiful stuff. And her kind of her jam is is blending, right? That's what she loves, and so she she got some of Jim's videos and started watching them, and she has no idea what he, like she can't follow it. She doesn't understand. It does not. She's like it does not compute. <laughs> you know, I'm watching it. I'm seeing it. It still doesn't make sense. You know, it's funny. Um, we have all that to say. So practice, right? And how do you get practice? You get practice by painting. Um, another thing uh, that when you practice. Ask uh, ask your peers for their opinions. Get get some reviews. Get some pointers. You know, have people ask questions and talk to you about what you did. Because they may they may reveal something. The questions they ask or the pointers they give may reveal something that helps you uh, go to that next level of painting. Yeah, like for example, Tony, <laughs> when I ask peer reviews or uh, peer opinions. Sometimes Tonio, maybe because he, he read uh, Le Grand Livre de la Figurine, but he comes up with something that I cannot do. So I will ask him, how do you do that? <laughs> so yeah, just check with your friends, like share what you do and encourage them to share what they do with you also. And sometimes you will trade techniques. Yeah, you know, and, and painting with friends is an important thing. We're, we're, I'm going to jump to that right now. Yeah. Um, so we actually had for quite a while, we had a weekly... Uh, painting group where we'd get together we'd all go to the local gaming store and we used to have between five and ten people and sometimes like 13 14 people show up to paint with us and we're all there painting sharing ideas sharing techniques and you know well i have to say that i'm sure yom and antoine didn't get as much from it as, as i did or some of the other people um them being kind of like the the, the higher caliber painters in our group uh it was still very useful for me, and I think it was very helpful for a lot of people who you know, don't necessarily paint as well as we do. Um, you know, just having someone who's a friend they can talk to 
because it's intimidating, uh, you know, asking random artists online or posting something up on Facebook and, and asking people for advice, you know, because you, you don't know. The, the internet is a very scary and, and brutal place sometimes. Mm -hmm. And there's so also at, the, the technology side. Some people don't have the, are, like, uh, smartphones available to take pictures or they don't have the, a good lightning set. So even if they take pictures out and they share them online, the work might not be clear and they won't get the answer they need. No, While that's absolutely true. in a painting group, people will see your model in the in their end and they'll be able to to judge by the exact effect and by, by what was really done yeah yeah and you know even if you don't have a, a local painting group at your store it's easy to form one yes you, it, it is amazing how many people are looking for something like this and and if you you know mention that hey you know i want to start something you know you build it they will come it's, it's as simple as that You'll be surprised how many people show up and want to take part in something like this. Just turn the baseball guy away. Yeah, exactly. Just to send the baseball <laughs> players back into the cornfield. Um, Maybe you know, we'll get old painters' ghosts coming out of the cornfield. <laughs> Can we paint with you guys? Yes, yes. <laughs> Creepy but cool. Okay. Creepy but cool. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it, but, you know, sometimes it's not always uh, possible to get together in person, which is one of the things we found out. You know, I, I had a I had a kid and, you know, Antoine moved, worked, got hectic. Uh, Yom has so many commissions. He can't really bring commissions to the store to work on because, you know, transporting is, is not practical. No, that would be, no. Yeah. No. So he would always, he would, he would show up with like models to clean and prep, like stuff that didn't require good lighting or, you know, if someone kicked the table, it wouldn't matter. Um, yep. So what we decided to start doing is we started doing Google Hangouts. Now, Google Hangouts has a limitation that, of course, you're not there in person. It's hard to show the models to each other. You can take pictures and share them. But you may run into the same problems Antoine already mentioned about not having a, a good camera or a setup, you know, lighting setup to do it. But at least it's still, it's still an alternative. And right? it's if you can't get... motivating to, even if you're not showing it, just being painting with other people who are doing it lets yeah. you paint longer most of the yeah. time. Make yeah, painting a yeah. social event. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you stay on the table uh, longer. Also, I mean, we're doing hangouts, and then someone has a question like, uh, "How do you, you will you do that?" So people start sharing opinions right live on the spot, and some people will just go like on. I mean, you're already on the computer, obviously, so they will go online, try to find a reference, and give the link to to the person. So it's all really fast. So it. Yes, it's entertaining, but it's also a quick way to just have opinions on your stuff. Yeah. Um, now, this this next one is a little bit more difficult because it involves going to a convention, right? So, But you, if, uh, before you jump in, oh. you don't need to go to a convention for that. Some people do it uh, at their local stores. Uh, uh, exp go go on, but you don't oh. have to go to a convention. This this is true. Uh, I'm just saying convention because the the doc says con. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're right. So attending attending a painting class. So, um, like to Antoine's point, a Antoine gives a class locally at a community center for beginning to intermediate painters. Uh, you know, you can go to take a class at uh, a, a convention. Like so, when I go to Depticon. I, I've booked three or four classes with different artists to mm. learn different techniques. Some people you know, do a class in store too. Like a, a bit like we did our painting group, but with somebody like uh, managing more, the, the session yeah. and uh, guiding people towards more structured. specific points. Yeah, more structured mm -hmm. than what we or informal version was. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's true. Um, and I find these, you know, the, the classes I've taken at, at stores and at cons uh, to be a great resource. You know, not every class is, is for me, but like I said, I always walk out of there with something, you know, and, and I look forward to doing it. It's my favorite part of Adepticon yeah. is going to the painting classes. My, my point was a bit too that um, for people attending cons already, like you, you go to Adepticon, you go to, go to Gen Con, whatever, the, don't overlook painting classes. That that was kind of my point. People yeah, I, will, I... will focus on tournaments or what deal they can find. What what game to try? But don't don't bypass those painting classes. 
Yeah, you can I, I... have several great artists, like big names in the industry, uh, just teaching you for two hours, three hours. Doesn't matter. You can line them up in a day and uh, come back with a lot of tools. Yeah. Yeah, and and they're pretty they're pretty reasonably priced. I mean, a, a day of classes will cost you probably about a hundred dollars for three classes, for like nine hours worth of class. That's really not bad. No. Um, I know it sounds like a lot, but it, it's really not that bad. Um, and and I've you know I, I've taken classes with Jessica Rich and uh, Rhonda Bender, and I'm taking some with Aaron Lovejoy and uh, Justin McCoy from Secret Weapon and Ben Comets. It's it, you know I know I'm gonna walk out of there with something. No, if you don't, there's something wrong. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, but some cons have better classes than others. Uh, Adepticon I find has really good classes. Uh, the ones at LVO I think were pretty good. Um, ReaperCon had amazing classes. You know all kinds of different stuff and just the um, the big painting room at ReaperCon where you can sit there and talk to any one of the, the, the artists that are at the con is, is fantastic for, for developing techniques. You know, you, you got a bunch of models out in front of Jen Haley and you want to know, how did you paint that sword? You can sit down and ask her and she'll spend, you know, five, 10 minutes talking to you about the color she used and what her thoughts were when she was painting it. And it's, it's really enlightening. Um, Gen Con I found was kind of um, disappointing for classes. Not not so much for the content. Well, yeah, I guess it is because of content. The the big problem is most of the classes at Gen Con are, are theory classes. There's they're not practical. Mm -hmm. So it's it's hard to sit there for an hour or, or two and get talked out about at about painting without trying stuff yourself. And then you're not really going to get to try that technique for three or four days till you get back from the con. So half of what you've you know you don't retain the same way. Yeah. So I found that was tough. Yeah, they give you handouts and everything, but I found it was tough. Yeah, pr practical classes, like we did uh, at Epticon, is perfect. They, yeah. They're showing you the technique, and uh, you try it, and if you're doing it wrong, they're going to tell you. Yeah, yeah Some and, and some artists are brutal about it, but it's for <laughs> your own good. Uh, I like Jessica. <laughs> I wasn't mentioning any names. <laughs> but yes, I meant Jessica. But that's okay. We love her anyway. She's uh, she's only brutally honest because she thinks we can take it, right? If 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 she, if she didn't know us as well as she does, she wouldn't be like that. It's the the double edged sword of friendship. <laughs> You're tough. I can beat you up. You're tough. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. See, it's all good. We survived. Um, yeah, and if if you can. Uh, this sounds like we're tooting our own horn here, but like the master classes we've organized, I, I think those have been great. Um, maybe not cheap, but I think worth worth every penny. I, I don't regret anything I spent on those classes. Um, maybe, maybe you guys feel a bit differently because you're you're a higher level, um, so you don't gain as much out of the class as I did. But I found them to be excellent uh, resources to learn from. Well, uh, Liz was a bit similar to me, so yeah, of course, I, I walk away with less tools, less new tools. But uh, the one with uh, the one with Meg taught me a lot. And it, it yes, it seemed costly, but it's an investment, people. I mean, it's gonna change the way you paint. And it's yeah. not costing you more than if you had done two full day of painting class at a convention. Anyway. No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 for sure. Um, I mean, $100 for eight hours of, of instruction where you've got a small class, uh, you know, we had 10 people. So you're getting a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, I think I think it was a good value, definitely. Yeah, and we're saying uh, the class we did, but other people like uh, Mathieu Fontaine is doing classes uh, almost everywhere except the, the States. And you can always find, is, and he has two different levels also, so different topics depending on which one. Yeah. He's doing one in Calgary, I think, in the coming weeks. Uh, he's doing some in the, <clears throat> in, in or Europe sometimes too, so. Yeah, he's, he's a, a bunch brilliant of painter, painter as well. But, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, those master classes are are a real gem. 
And if and you if can't you can... find one, d organize one. Yeah. That's what you yeah, did, it, Paul. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's not that hard, right? These these artists, uh, this is their living. So they're, they're more than happy to go to you. If you have the people to attend the class, they're more than happy to, to figure out a way to get to you to, to teach it. You know, they're, they're, they're looking for work like anyone else. So it, it hasn't been hard. You know, I, I talked to Meg. Um, I, I messaged her. I was at Gen Con, actually. And I just messaged her and I started talking to her about it. And I said, okay, if I help organize one in Montreal, would you come? And she's like, yeah, I haven't been to Montreal for a number of years. I would love to go. And lo and behold, we had a great class with a, with a crazy turnout because it was their last class in North America. Um, and it was so good, in fact, that she planned, like, the day she was leaving, we talked about doing one in 2017. So, uh, you know, we're planning a, a I was going to say a rematch, but it's not really the term I'm looking for. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, a second edition of the class at some point. Um, and it was like that with Liz. I, I met Liz... Uh, through a, a mutual friend, Julian Walker, and got to know her a little bit at Adepticon and talked to her. I said, well, you know, would you like to teach a class? Um, just because I, I thought her her personality would lend itself to, to teaching. And her her curriculum that she, she wanted to teach seemed interesting for beginners and intermediate painters and even for some advanced people. So I said, you know, let, let's let's get this let's let's get this worked out. And uh, it wasn't a huge class, but uh, was, you know we had we had ten people per day. She was happy with the numbers. We were all happy as students, uh, and I, yeah. I think it worked out really well. Yeah, it was a nice setup for the class, and she she could afford spending more time with each people, each person. Yeah. So yeah, it was a good format. It was a good class. And and even now I'm working on on the next master class, uh, because the first two were were so well received. Um. I'm actually working. Should I say? Sure. Okay. Um, the, the hype, the hype, the hype, the hype, the suspense. <laughs> so I'm actually working uh, with James Wapple to get him up here. Uh, hopefully later this year, uh, in the you know September October time frame, to um, to teach for a couple days, and I think that'll be something to see. Yeah. Oh, I'm not missing that one for sure. Yeah. James, or as I like to call him, Crazy Uncle Jim. Because um, <laughs> that's that's how he refers to himself uh, for, you know, for my daughter. He calls himself Crazy Uncle Jim because when she was a baby, I used to watch, I'd sit up watching his painting videos at night when the baby was keeping me up at three o'clock in the morning and to get to the point where the baby would sleep whenever James would start talking. So there were several nights where uh, James Wapple and Garage Hammer were the two things that put baby to sleep. So I got a lot of James Wapple and Garage Hammer in for a few months. <laughs> um, yeah, so getting him up here, I think, will be will be great. And I know uh, Antoine's got kind of a soft spot for Jim. <laughs> it was fun. I, I've met him at uh, Gen Con, and the I I talked with him a lot uh, while he was at the. Uh, while well, was so this boot painting right in front of the people and just answering questions and it, it was a a lot of fun and you know he he loves teaching that way he 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 likes the structured classes but he really likes like he'll go to a con and he'll have his couple classes he's teaching <clears throat> excuse me but he'll then he'll just have in his spare time he'll sit in a common area and pull out paints and just start painting and he'll gather a crowd. People just sit around and chat with him. And he'll talk about what he's doing and why he's doing it. And he, he will scrap the model he's working... This is the, what kills me. He will scrap the model he's working on. Like blob some paint on it. You know, destroy it, basically. And then redo it to show you how he did it. Right? Or he'll go, well, you know, I did it this way. But you could do it this way, too. And he'll just swap the colors on the palette and just start, you know, throwing color on the model. <laughs> And what's amazing is that he's so fluid about it. You know, I, I could never be like that. I don't have an artist's brain, but it, it just comes so naturally to him. Uh, but he also gets that other people don't see it that way. So he's got a very good teaching technique. Um, like a, a good bedside manner, I guess you could say. So I, I think that'll go well here. 
So uh, I'll have more info for that uh, as we go on into the summer. But it's it's being worked on. <laughs> All right. I you know, I think we've pretty much gone through the list. Was was there anything else or anything I missed? Uh probably but uh, I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe listeners if you've if you've done something or you found something that helped you that we didn't mention here, you could post a comment on our our Facebook and we'd love to hear from you. Um, Because it's always cool to hear, you know, what works for other people, you know. Because there's, there's, like I said, there's, there's no right or wrong way to, to learn. And everyone's got different ways of doing it. So it'd be curious. I'm just curious to see what, uh, what's worked for other people. It also confirms that not all the listeners are bots. (laughs) (laughs) That would be nice to know too. Yes. (laughs) Well, no. Mike, Mike writes us questions, so we know Mike is a real person. Or is he? Or is he? No, I've, I've met him, so I know he's a real person. And the guys from Gamers Vault are real people, and they listen to the show too, so. I think uh, that's at least five people. So we know we have at least five real listeners. <laughs> Eight if we count ourselves. <laughs> Crazy, well, man. we know that Yom doesn't listen to the show, so. <laughs> that's true. Uh, he, he doesn't listen to the ones he's on, so we'll just have to stop having him on so he listens to more shows. It'll boost our numbers. <laughs> yeah, boost numbers by not having me on. I, I mean, it, it makes sense. <laughs> Actually, you know, Antoine was saying last episode the, the numbers were kind of low, so maybe there's a correlation with Yom and low numbers. <laughs> yeah, not because I'm actually listening, but because maybe people don't want me on the show. Because you drive people away. Yeah, you with know, my swab French accent. Well, no, Antoine's accent is suave. Yours is just kind of, you know, yo. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I think we're rambling now. Uh, shall we call it? Yes. Do we have any shout outs? Not this week. No, not right now. Nope. Awesome. Okay. Well, you know what? Actually, I'm just going to give a little shout out to John Chastanay because, you know, he, he wanted listening material for skiing. And skiing season's almost over, and we've got two episodes back-to-back for him. So he better take advantage and hit the slopes. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) On that note, I guess we'll sign off. So see you next time. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, geeks. Thanks for listening to Geeks of the North. If you want to contact us, you can email us at geeksofthenorth at gmail.com. Read our blog at geeksofthenorth.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash geeks of the north or follow us on Twitter at geeks of the north. You can follow me, Paul, on Twitter at PR Filio and Antoine at El Tonio Berg. See you in two weeks, geeks. Thank you for checking out a United Geeks Network family member. If you enjoyed it and are looking for other online media with a geek culture slant, head over to unitedgeeksnetwork.com where you will find Broken Prism Reviews, a YouTube channel bringing you game reviews in three parts, unboxing, express gameplay, and a quick rundown of what makes the game stand out. The United Geeks Network. You can broadcast your geekiness at unitedgeeksnetwork.com.